Could reclining your airline chair possibly back you into a lawsuit? The latest on the viral video on the American Airlines flight. And the landmark Me Too movement trial, how Harvey Weinstein's character could convict him. Welcome to Hashtag Lawyers, trending in, law, trending in law and business here in DFW. I'm your host, Austin Pennington, and here's my co-host, Andrea Seffens-Turner. Brand new last name, y'all. Glad to have you guys here, and we want to talk a little bit about the reason we're doing this show and, and what Andrea and I, what you and I have seen a lot mm -hmm. is that there's a lot of things that the law touches. It really it touches everything that, that you and I are aware of, but a lot of our non-lawyer citizens, colleagues, friends, don't actually know what the law actually says, what it doesn't say whenever we see current events. And so we really want to educate some people on what it means and what it, what it looks like when you apply this to our everyday lives. Absolutely. And I think something, Austin, that I see a lot with my friends who are not lawyers, they'll see a news story, they'll see something on Twitter, on Instagram, and they'll say, that's not fair. That should be illegal. The law should protect him or her, you know, that puppy. And at the end of the right. day, I know there was another airline story, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, when you're looking at an issue that's legal in nature, you can't lead with what's fair and you can't lead with what's moral. You have to go in with the mindset of the law is the law and it's different from what is moral and what's fair. And I think that's so hard for people that are not in the legal field to understand. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's a probably a frustration we see yes. day in and day out is that this isn't fair, but but this is what legal, and that kind of actually that leads us to our first story about fairness and whether mm -hmm. someone has a legal action. I know you've you've heard about this viral video of the American Airlines seat passenger reclining her chair, and, and from from the reports that Fox News and other people have put out, we've seen the video. Um, the man is repeatedly just jabbing, punching, punching the back of her chair because she, uh, I guess, reclined it, and it, it made his seat a little too narrow for for his liking. And y'all, I'm gonna be so honest, I always recline my seat once, you know, the flight attendants tell me I can. So, I mean, whew, I feel for her, not gonna lie. Yeah, and I don't think, from looking at the video, it's it's indisputable that this mm -hmm. guy, this guy was acting like a jerk. I mean, right, he's, I, from what I counted, I saw nine punches on the back of the chair, and I think you could see the chair kind of jolting forward, mm -hmm. and, and, and she's filming, like, selfie, you know, out next to her chair. And so I don't think we can dispute any of that. I, I think what's, what's made this go viral is, uh, one, Miss, Miss Williams' Twitter page. She, she's yes. gone to Twitter to report all these, these wrongs that happened with this man, mm -hmm. and then I think the insult to injury part is the way the, the flight agent handled this dispute. Did you hear about that yes, part? Yes, I did hear about that part. How finally, after all these jabs, the flight attendant comes over and then apologizes to the man punching Ms. Williams' seat and offers him a free cocktail? He got a free cocktail. He got some Captain Morgan Excuse from what I Excuse me? <laughs> I, think, I think that probably pissed her off more than anything is that not only does he not get scolded, he gets a free drink. And then I think she, she got a, a, a notice of some sort that uh, a... Um, a dis disruptive passenger notice from from the airline, uh, so so I think that's that's part of what I would assume motivated some of this mm -hmm. rant on Twitter. And and if you look to her Twitter page, you see that there's just posting after posting, and she's getting into arguments back and forth. And and so a lot of people have asked, what's the criminal liability here? What's the civil liability Absolutely. here? And, and and I've done a number of, of interviews about this, and mm -hmm. and I don't see any criminal liability. I mean, you and I were discussing this. That we were. Yeah. There's you know difference between assault and offensive touching, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, For, you might want to explain what assault and offensive touching is because, you know, to the average Joe on the street, that's kind of the same thing. Right. Right. Well, that's a good point. So like here in Texas, we've got assault where you mm -hmm. actually you actually strike somebody intentionally. Yeah. And, and one of the key elements that, that we get caught up on is that you mm -hmm. actually have to cause physical pain to actually have a class B or a class A or, mm -hmm. or even a felony assault here in Texas. Uh, we also have the, the class C version that you and I were discussing that. It's really the equivalent of a, of a traffic ticket, and that only has to be offensive touching. So I think here in this situation, the only thing we're dealing with that even remotely would, would look like an assault would be an mm -hmm. offensive touching, I guess, through the seat? Yeah, I suppose that could be an offensive touching through the seat. Although, honestly, what busy prosecutor is going to want to take that case? Right, and that's why, and that's why I think that we don't have one there. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger thing, especially if you look at Miss Williams' Twitter page, and yes. you see she makes claims that she's had headaches and that she can't sleep, and that uh, she, 
she doesn't say she's had cervical injuries, but she makes reference to previous spine mm -hmm. surgeries and a fused C1. I mean, what does that sound like to you that she's doing? Well, to me, that sounds like a fragile egg plaintiff who's saying, you kept punching my C and now I have actually been damaged and I have been injured. And lo and behold, she's fulfilling one of those elements that you just listed. Right, right. That she's claimed that she's being injured and, and that she may need some compensation from, mm -hmm. from I guess, this man. I, I would assume she's probably going to want to go after the airline in some well, way, shape, or form. who has the deeper pocket? I mean, I have no idea what this man does for a living, but airlines usually have pretty deep pockets. Right, right. Well, I mean, so let, let's focus on the airline. Do you, do you see an angle that Miss Williams can take to try and sue the airline? Do you, do you see anything out there that she could potentially get money from them for? From the airline, not necessarily, but I do think that she does have an angle with the gentleman punching the back of her seat. Okay. And that angle would be intentional infliction of emotional distress. And that's a mouthful, right? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. sounds like a lot of fun. Let's hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> Only lawyers would think this is right, fun, but exactly. you know, there you go. So intentional infliction of emotional distress is literally just what it sounds like, is engaging in some sort of action that is going to cause the victim emotional distress. So the very classic case that all young law students hear about in their early days in torts class is the story about a gentleman who was at a dinner club and he was in line to at the buffet along with his colleagues in a crowded dining room to get his lunch. Now this gentleman is African American and the manager, I believe, for the dinner club came in shouted at him with some very racially inappropriate words right and then austin i'm going to use your hand okay <laughs> we're going to pretend your my ipad is the plate okay there you go austin is our gentleman i am the awful manager he's yelling these terrible things and then rips the plate out of the man's hands the man sued and the court upheld that that was intentional infliction of emotional distress because he was touching a plate which was touching the gentleman's body okay and so you have that connection there between mm -hmm. the inanimate object and the the victim we'll call exactly them, uh, in that situation and it, from what i recall i mean it, it's got to be something extreme yes it right? does it, have it, to be extreme that's a key element of it, mm -hmm. it it's got to be i think we've even seen cases where where judges have said that it's got to be outrageous this is yes. this isn't just offensive it's actually just pushing to the point of of ridiculousness it has to outrage the i think the standard of society okay if you will okay well that brings up a great point so we've We've got a common thing that happens all the time: people reclining their seats. I mean, I what, do it. Well, what do you think? So that's that's a you know something many people in society do. Mm -hmm. Do you think this man's conduct of repeatedly punching? I mean, obviously we're not you know, we're not a jury, we're not a judge, but okay. just repeated action of punching the back of her seat. I mean, you think she has a shot at that raising to that level? I think it's a tenuous case, but depending mm -hmm. on the judge you would get in that situation, I think there's a maybe because okay. he is punching the back of her seat, which is connected to her body because she's leaning on it. And especially if she actually had, you know, some sort of, you know, cervical damage because she had had some sort of surgery, I think she has a shot. Okay. Now, do I think it's a good shot? No. Right. But I think there's something there, possibly. Well, and, and I think I would agree with you on that. I think that probably what we're looking at is she's going to get more attention in the media than she Definitely. will in a court of law. And that's that's actually this story. It's funny. You know, we, we let in talking about fairness and what the law says. Mm -hmm. Should she be compensated? Should she not? Everybody's going to have a different opinion mm -hmm. and, and what's fair and not fair. It, it sounds like the law side of it, it's, it's going to be hard for her to, to receive any compensation mm -hmm. or to, for him to receive any punishment for that matter. I think what's what's interesting about this is it sparked a larger debate on well, what's proper etiquette, etiquette, excuse me, if you're reclining, not reclining, should you sure. ask, all those things. Mm -hmm. And I think we've heard actual airline uh, CEOs and executives mm -hmm. talk about these things. And, and I think, uh, you know, we were talking before we went on yeah. air about the, the Delta CEO. And I think the quote that I, I read from him is that he, he says he thinks that you should ask permission before reclining your seat. What do you think about that? You know what? I think that's so sweet of him. And as the CEO of Delta, if you want to lead with an amazing example, you do you. I support that. <laughs> I'm going to lean my seat back. Okay. Not, not asking at all. No. Not even if you got a six foot five guy behind you. No. Oh, I've done that before. <laughs> I was very tired. <laughs> okay. What, did you have any problems with that when you did it? 
No, he was okay. fine. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. I know I actually was a fan of what the, the spokesperson mm-hmm. for American Airlines came out and said, because I think it, it brings to light one of the bigger problems we have in our society today is um, he or she said that this could have all been avoided had the passengers simply been respectful to one mm-hmm. another. And, and I, I agree with that. I'm not trying to sing Kumbaya or anything like that. Do you obviously. want me to get you a guitar right now? I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> I'd probably mess it up. But, but the, I, just, I think we could have avoided some of those things had these people potentially been more considerate. Sure. And I think that's something that we see in this situation and that we see just in the law in general. If people would just be a little bit more respectful and just communicate a little better with each other instead of, hold on, I can only talk to you if I talk to you via Snapchat, Mm -hmm. then maybe we'd avoid some of these problems. Yeah, I I think so. And I think probably the the last thing I do want to cover on this is a lot of people have asked, should the airline, whether there's an avenue right now in the law or Mm -hmm. not, should the airline actually be responsible somewhat for not policing this, especially with the agent who a lot of people think didn't do her job, didn't yeah. reprimand the right person, mm-hmm. got the guy liquored up after he was already punching the chair, all that kind of stuff. I mean, what do, what do, you, what do you think about the airline's culpability there, whether legal or not legal? Do you, should they be held responsible for something like this? I mean, honestly, I'm not thinking of any laws that they're breaking. I do think they could have handled it a lot better. Mm -hmm. And I do find it very questionable that you've had someone display aggressive behavior, punching a seat again and again, and then you give him liquor. Right. That is very questionable. You know, that's adding fuel to the fire. And maybe the better situation would have been if there was another seat available, although maybe there was, maybe there wasn't, maybe switching them setting them apart. If it was really bad, which it sounds like, why not put one of them in the jump seat? Right. Now, I say that with the caveat. I haven't looked to see if there's an FAA regulation against <laughs> that. There sure very there well may be. I'm sure there is. So if there is, don't do that. <laughs> we like the rules. You're right, right. Well, and I think that if she, if he or she, I don't recall the, the gender of the agent, but mm-hmm. had they de-escalated the situation, we Absolutely. we might be in a, in a different place. And uh, your comments actually bring up something that I've been questioning since this story broke, which mm-hmm. is, I'd like to hear some of the other side of Absolutely. what happened. And that's that's the lawyer in us that we like to cross-examine. Sure. We like to know the full story. Mm-hmm. But being able to see, okay, was Miss Williams acting out earlier in the flight? Is that why the agent acted the way he or she did? Mm-hmm. Uh, was this man, did he try peacefully to resolve this beforehand? And, and we're not hearing that side. And actually, some of the, the trolls, as Miss Williams refers to them on Twitter, uh, they've actually asked that same question. You know, what else was going on at this time? So. You know, hopefully we'll hear some more information. We mm-hmm. may or may or may not, but um, it's it's an interesting story and um, doesn't probably involve the law as much as everyone thinks. But it definitely asks some some serious questions about that. There's there's another story that came out of out of Canada actually that absolutely involves the law. A uh, Canadian businessman businessman, as Fox News reports, actually literally burned one million dollars in cash to avoid paying alimony or child support to his ex-wife. Did you hear so about he, the story? he literally brought wads of cash out and just lit them on lit fire. Lit them on fire. Lighter fluid, match, boom. I kind of hope he YouTubed that. I don't think he did because he thought he <laughs> might get away with it. But, well, and you see the testimony in court. The the man is, is testifying and the judge, he says, well, I burned $1 million and we have this asset. And the judge says, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, you did what? Mm-hmm. He says, well, I, I burned it. I was like, what do you mean burned it? I said, well, I, I lit it on fire. What do, you, what do you expect? I mean, he looked at him as if... Why is this so preposterous? Why are you looking at me this way? And, and it, it was it was definitely an interesting exchange. Um, you know, one of the questions, well, the end result was the judge ended up sentencing him to 30 days in jail, ordered him to pay his ex-wife $2,000 a day for every day he failed to disclose his finances. Because that was another issue. Mm-hmm. He, was, he wasn't telling her his finances and then he was burning his finances, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, in your experience, would burning your assets, whether cash, cars, whatever, you think that helps you avoid pay alimony or spouse or uh, excuse me child support absolutely not child support <laughs> is a sticky sticky little sucker it stays with you no matter what well and i can only imagine the policy uh, things that we would be encouraging if we allowed people to <laughs> to destroy their assets in order to avoid paying child support what do you think about this guy doing this i think he's ridiculous i think also that he probably i don't know if he had a lawyer but if he did, he definitely didn't consult that lawyer before burning wads of cash. Right. Also, isn't that government property? That's a good question. I think is I think that's a question that I would actually like to look yeah. into. Is that is that a crime to actually burn like 
currency in well, the United States? And so that's a good question. I, I'm not sure on that one. That's a, when they may have some First Amendment issues there mm-hmm. because you could be making a statement. But I, I did look into the arson side of it. Sure. You know, we hear about arson mm-hmm. all the time, and in Texas, arson requires that you actually burn a physical object like this table or this building. And I'm not suggesting anybody go light the building on fire, but we have no lighters. We, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. But, but the idea is you've got to actually burn a piece of property. And Absolutely. there's some ancillary requirements. Mm-hmm. Usually, most of the time, as we're used to hearing about this, it has to do with some type of insurance fraud. You're trying to collect sure. on some money. And so this definitely, in Texas at least, <clears throat> would not qualify as arson because you're burning cash and that doesn't fall under the, the stipulation. But uh, what what absolutely did happen here, the one criminal side of this that's very clear is a, a contempt proceeding or a contempt yes. holding. So uh, tell me a little bit about contempt. What you know, you, we, we hear, oh, you're going to be sure. held in contempt. I mean, mm-hmm. there's two different types. I and mean, what, what is contempt? Sure. So the quick and dirty definition for contempt is that the judge has given you a direct order and then you choose to disobey that order. Mm-hmm. So a great example would be um, the judge has said, from 30 days from today, I want you to disclose... I want you to produce to the other side the partnership agreement for your business entity. Or your finances in a child support case. Or your finances <laughs> in a child support case, which is highly relevant. And then 30 days goes by, and on day 31, you haven't done that. Go on and on. 45 days later, you still haven't done that. At that point, you are now liable for being held in contempt of court because you violated a judge's direct orders to you. So in contempt basically means you're defying the judge's orders. Exactly. And the judge is an arm of the court. And so by that mm-hmm. extension, you're defying the court's orders. And, yes. and from from for everybody's edification, contempt is both, it can be punishment and it can be coercive, mm-hmm. right? So it can, yes. it can you know, punish you for your acts, but also part of it is to force someone to do something, right? Absolutely. So like in this situation, the judge is wanting him to disclose his finances. You're going to sit in jail. You're going to pay a mm-hmm. fine <clears throat> until you actually do that. Have you actually ever been in court when a lawyer's been held in contempt? No, we got close once. I had opposing counsel who, he was six months late in producing documents that were very necessary for me to prove my case. Mm-hmm. And the judge leaned over and was said, sir, Mr. So-and-so, you've got 15 days to get her those documents or else I will hold you in contempt. So I've actually seen one closer and a little more dramatic. Oh. I was in a, a family law hearing, and it wasn't my hearing. I was watching. But sure. man uh, is going off. I mean, yelling in the courtroom and, and talking over the judge, mm-hmm. which you're never supposed to do, as, That's as we know. That's a big no-no, you know, everyone. <laughs> well, and, and yelling at the judge at this point and, and criticizing really? her ruling. And it's a discovery motion. So this, this is very minor, mundane, routine deal. Uh, and, and it got to the point where the judge said, called her bailiff's name, mm-hmm. and he stood up. And he said, Mr. So-and-so, would you like a few minutes to cool off in the holding cell? And the entire courtroom got quiet because regardless of what we see on TV, this doesn't sure. really happen. Mm-hmm. So, so actually getting to watch one is everybody's like leaning forward, looking, okay, someone's about to get cuffed and thrown in the holding <laughs> cell with the rest of the, the people that are down here for mm-hmm. their, their jail visit. You know, uh, He didn't end up getting tossed in, although I think he, he deserved it. But that's that's one of those things that you hear about, but a lot of people are unsure how that ever even comes about, you know? So long story short, always listen to the judge. Right. Don't talk over them and don't tell the judge how to do their job. Or burn your money if you're, you're being yeah, ordered to pay child support. don't burn your money. Well, and, and this, the sad thing about this is, is that you and I offline have talked numerous mm-hmm. times about parents not holding up to their end of the bargain to spite their ex-spouse. And that's, it's, this is a funny story because he burned his money, but at the same time, it's disheartening. I mean, it, Yes, I know you're going through a divorce, but mm-hmm. let's let's own, have some responsibility here and think about the kids, right? Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, the kid is being affected by all of this. That money is for the kid's child support right. predominantly. <clears throat> Why would you want to take that away from your child? No, I know. I, I agree. I agree. And, and Sad. hopefully this story plays out. He, this, this man will end up literally and figuratively paying for, for his, his crime or his, mm-hmm. excuse me, his actions. Uh, speaking of crime, uh, another huge story going on right now is the Harvey Weinstein yes. trial. And that's something that's been, it's been ramped up for, for probably a year, over a year, two years now at this point, just over the allegations year, yeah. and everything like that. And there's, there's so much in this story that we can't cover the entire piece of it. Yeah. But uh, the, the highlights are uh, Harvey Weinstein being tried on two counts of sex assault for two different victims mm-hmm. in New York. Uh, the trial wrapped up Thursday, February 13th. Closing arguments occurred. Now the, the jury stepped back today mm-hmm. to, to convince, or excuse me, continue their deliberations. They, they yep. took yesterday off for President's Day. 
and, and there's a lot of interesting things. One of the, the high points we want to talk about is how did the prosecution get all the evidence of his prior accusers, not, not mm -hmm. the victims in this case, but his prior accusers in to talk about that. And, and so, uh, you know, we've, we've discussed a little bit about character yes. evidence. Might we need to tell the audience about how that high level, how that kind of works in, in mm -hmm. our, our courts of law? Absolutely. So character evidence is a tricky little subject that people who are not educated in the legal field will say, oh, well, you know, so-and-so, you know, drinks too much, they party too much, they burn through money, and they are just not a responsible person. Well, you can't bring all that in because that's character evidence, and most character evidence is actually not permitted as evidence in a court of law. Now, there are very, very narrow and specific exceptions. And I think that's what the prosecutors were aiming for in the Weinstein trial. Right. And I think one of the things that we see probably on a daily basis a lot is um, you've got someone on trial for a domestic dispute, yes. you know, assault of their, of their spouse, and they've got a previous conviction for mm -hmm. fighting in a bar, bar fight, yeah. assault case. And, and so that evidence of that previous conviction is typically not allowed to come in mm -hmm. as evidence that this person's a violent person, that this is a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And I think some people have a hard time wrapping their minds around that, right? Sure. I mean, it is pretty abstract because at the end of the day, sure, it sounds relevant that, you know, he's a bad guy. We have all these examples that he's a bad guy. Why can't that be brought in in a court of law? It's relevant, isn't it? Well, and that's what I think probably the, the number one response I get from that is, well, if he did it back then, then of course he did it this time. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the rules of evidence are trying to prevent from happening because, exactly. because this, this court is trying, did he assault this person on this day in this way? And mm -hmm. so if you're tainting the minds of the jurors or the mm -hmm. judge and saying, well, if he got in a fight here, he must have done it here. Well, then you're not actually assessing whether or not he did it here. And that's part of, if you want to go back to, to colonial times, part of mm -hmm. the, the the laws and the, the oppression and the types of trials that were going on back then that we're trying to, to prevent with these rules of evidence. But here, interestingly enough, we've got two victims mm -hmm. of, of Harvey Weinstein accusing him of sexually assaulting them in a hotel room and, and saying that he lured them up there with the promise of, if you come up, we can talk about your career. I'm going to totally interrupt you one second. Uh -huh. uh, I think actually one of them was in Weinstein's actual home when okay. he, yeah, he forced... I haven't given a trigger warning, so I'm not going to go into it, but yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Forced an act. <laughs> right, 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 right. And, but but it's, it's, you know, under the guise of, you know, if I can, I can advance your career and yes. it leads to him. 100%. You know, the allegations are it leads to him forcing himself on these women. Mm -hmm. And so the, the prosecution outside of those two women was able to bring a number of other accusers yes. to come in and testify about their experiences. I mean, we haven't been able to delve into the minutia details of what the of court ruled and all those things, but what do you think happened there? How do you think the prosecution was able to get that in? Well, the prosecution was trying to establish a pattern of behavior for sexual violence. Okay. And so I think they were able to take a small exception for character evidence and they were able to bring it in to prove a pattern of behavior. And it's a small exception. And it's a very tenuous one. I have actually never seen it done in my practice. Me neither. And so I am surprised that it got in. Right. Especially since, to my knowledge, none of those were actually convicted cases because there is a possibility to bring in past felonies that one has been convicted of right. within the last 10 years right. into the current trial. You know, right. Rules do allow that, but those don't fall into that exception. So I'm very interested once this case is appealed, which I'm sure it will be, absolutely, to see what the appellate court thinks of the trial court letting all yeah. that in. Well, and, uh, and we're both saying that we believe it'll be appealed, and that's because from what mm -hmm. we've seen, we both believe that they will come back with a guilty verdict. Yes, that's what we think right, personally. Right. And just, just for everybody's understanding too, if they were to come back with a not guilty verdict, there are only very limited circumstances yes. where the state can actually appeal mm -hmm. the decision of a lower court. And that's, that's a protection on individual rights. Absolutely. Uh, whereas a guilty verdict basically the defendant has an automatic right to appeal if they mm -hmm. follow the certain procedural steps and, and all that. But I things. think this brings up a really good point because if you look at the O.J. Simpson trial mm -hmm. way back in the day, right. and I, well, I'm not young enough to uh, have understood white Bronco jokes, right. you know, <laughs> right, something like that. The interesting thing about the O.J. Simpson trial is that, you know, extremely publicized, the criminal trial acquitted. Right. 
Civil trial, sometime later, found guilty. Right. Now, to the average person on the street, they're going to say, hold on, isn't that double jeopardy? That's violating your rights. You can't be tried twice for the same crime. And what would you say to them? Well, and that's the interesting thing that, that we're probably going to see in the Weinstein trial, mm -hmm. if he is acquitted or if he's not, because sure. you, right, you can still sue somebody even if they're found guilty, uh, is that you've got a burden of proof issue, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody's heard that phrase beyond a reasonable doubt, and, yeah. and it's got to be a unanimous verdict by the jury mm -hmm. to actually convict somebody and, and, and get a guilty verdict. In a criminal court. Yeah. Or not guilty verdict, <laughs> either one. In a criminal yeah. court, yes, ma'am. Um, but in a civil court, two things are different. One, whereas beyond a reasonable doubt is the burden of proof mm -hmm. for the state in a criminal court, we have this lawyer term, which it's always so hard to explain, in my opinion, or at least the phrasing of it. It's by a preponderance of the evidence. Yes, and so... Go ahead. Please explain <laughs> it. You're, you do a better job explaining this than I do. So. Oh, gosh. Y'all, I really wish I had stacks of paper with me today. Right. I did not bring any. But so by a preponderance of the evidence basically means more likely than not. And it is such a kind of abstract concept. And so I like to, in... You know, if I represent the plaintiff in an opening argument, I like to take two stacks of paper, just plain old printer paper, then I would say a preponderance of the evidence is more likely than not. And all it has to be, and I'll take one sheet of paper off the top of one pile and drop it on the other and say, the evidence could be as thin as that sheet of paper, but if that's enough to make it more likely than not, then the plaintiff has made has met their burden of proof. So we're looking, I mean, I've heard the, the 51%, 49% mm -hmm. con, you know, discussion before too. So we're, we're talking just basically tipping the scales, right, yeah. a little bit. And so in a civil trial that Harvey Weinstein, more likely than not, will face, mm -hmm. he could be sued for that and, and could be found liable mm -hmm. for, for damages against his, his alleged victims. There's also the possibility of settlement. That's, that's one of the big possibilities in civil, right? So, so, I mean, what would, in your opinion, what do you think the motivation is if, say, say Weinstein is acquit acquitted, right. what, do you, what do you think the motivation is for these women to go through a long, drawn-out civil lawsuit at that point? Well, you know, it's going to depend on the individual woman. Some of them might be really energized and really driven by the idea of justice wasn't done. He did this to me, allegedly. Allegedly did right. this to me. And I want there to be justice. I want the courts to find that this person did what I said he did, allegedly. Or they could be driven by the idea that I have suffered and I have had medical expenses. I have had psychiatric treatment. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they actually have, but commonly I have seen that before in similar cases and they want to be reimbursed and they were they want to say if i can't get justice in a criminal trial then i at least want some form of compensation and some recognition of my pain and my suffering and at the end of the day really the only and best thing that the court can do in a civil case for someone who has been allegedly raped is to compensate her with money damages right. Well, especially with someone who's got who has assets, mm -hmm. has the pockets to be able to fund it, and and really what we've seen, part of because of the the burden of proof and the evidence, but also just the nature of our judicial system, the likelihood of success in a civil action where there's settlement possibilities, yes. there's mediation, there's arbitrations, there's uh, proponents of the evidence yeah. with the with the trial, the the evidentiary standards are different. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more likely that these women are going to have success there. Well, more likely is the wrong term. It's easier for them to have yes. success on the civil side mm -hmm. than on the criminal side, right? And I think too, success, like you were discussing earlier, success on the, the civil side, excuse me, it can be a win at trial. It can right. be a settlement. It could be getting to a mediation and settling at mediation. And I mean, that could be a win for them too. And there's just more ways to win right. in the civil side of things. A lot, lot of avenues at sure. that point. And winning is different in the civil side. It is, it is. And, and I think, and this, this kind of brings me to the last point about, about this subject. I, mm -hmm. I do think we'd be remiss if we didn't explore this trial in the context of the Me Too movement. Yes. Because a lot of people are calling this the, the landmark trial for the Me Too movement mm -hmm. because uh, Weinstein has been seen as a, a villain and kind of a, I mean, he's, he's been poster child with the opposite of a poster child, if you will, about this entire yeah. situation. And so do you think, and, and we don't know, we don't have anything to base this off of, yeah. but just opinion wise, do you think that the Me Too movement and, and the, the just social and political forces mm -hmm. behind that, do you think that's affected anything to do with this case, whether it's, you know, the decisions of the prosecution, the evidentiary 
rulings by the judge, mm -hmm. anything like that. What do you think? Absolutely, because the and I heard a little clip of the prosecutor's closing argument today on NPR. Shout out to NPR, y'all are great. <clears throat> and her theme for her closing argument was power. That for Harvey Weinstein, and I'm going to paraphrase her words, he could do these things to these women allegedly because to them, to him, it was basically like stepping on ants. They didn't have the power to bring him the, to justice. They didn't have the power to stand up for themselves. And he can get away with it. And I think that concept and that theme of power, you know, sexual harassment in the workplace, you see that in all of the Me Too cases. Right. Or I shouldn't say all. I should say a large number it's of a common, It's a common problem right, yes. that we see, yeah. And so I think that in of itself ties the Weinstein trial into the rest of the Me Too movement. And I do think that we could possibly see some changes in policy and evidentiary rules moving forward. Well, and our law is supposed to adapt with society, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. A, a lot of our laws have remained intact since the founding fathers wrote them, mm -hmm. but a lot of our laws change over time. And, and I think one of the things I, I can't help but draw the analogy in my mind, albeit it's on the opposite side of the table, but sure. you know, the OJ trial yes. became very racially charged and the defense Extremely. used that to their advantage. Uh, the prosecution here is using, I believe, they're using the Me Too movement to their mm -hmm. advantage. And I'm not saying that's wrong because, I, I mean, it's, that's their job is to yeah. prosecute a man that they believe committed these crimes. Absolutely. And, and our, society, our law is, should bend to society's needs. Mm -hmm. and so I, I think that it's, if I was in that seat, if I was the, the prosecutor, I would be doing the same thing because it's Absolutely. making a statement that identifies with the jurors. 100%. So another big story that's just gone on here in the last 24 hours that is creating a lot of waves with a lot of people because it affects so many people is the Boy Scouts of America filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Literally the last 24 hours. Literally. I literally. hadn't even heard of it before Austin walked in this morning. Well, and, and it's, it's, it's sad on a number of, of, of different mm -hmm. fields. Now, one of the positive things, and this is something, bankruptcy is something that is a very nebulous concept to a lot of people. And one of the positive things is that they are filing for Chapter 11, which, as we know, means the Boy Scouts are still going to operate. Mm -hmm. They're still a going concern, so to speak, but they're going to reorganize is yes. what the idea is. You want to kind of explain a little bit like what that means? Sure. I mean, and for all y'all there, I am not a bankruptcy right, attorney. Right. I mean, <laughs> neither. And this, so this is very surface level, and that's kind of what you sure. know. Sure. Right. So what that means is that the Boy Scouts are filing bankruptcy, but because they're filing a Chapter 11 bankruptcy as opposed to a Chapter 7 or 13, these are all, and these chapters are chapters in the bankruptcy code, right. which is its own special court system, and attorneys actually have to be specifically admitted to those courts. So it is a very specialized field. But Chapter 11 would allow the Boy Scouts to reorganize and to come back into operation having paid off certain debts and continue to operate under a new structure and then the idea is the hope when you file mm -hmm. chapter 11 for most companies is that you figure out a way to get through this and then you yeah. keep you keep running right versus you know some of the other chapters you just you shut down you do not have the assets to pay it off fire and sale basically right yeah yeah you're done S sell it sell it as for whatever bidder that the bidders will take and Let's try to pay off our creditors. And, and and the creditors here, the, the main issue that has led to this is the the hundreds of lawsuits alleging the sexual misconduct, mm -hmm. which is, is partially what makes this truly sad. Yes. And, and a lot of people, when they first hear that, their their initial inclination is, well, that's, that's terrible. The victims aren't going to be compensated. But that's not actually the case because it's under Chapter 11, right? Mm -hmm. It is under Chapter 11, right? And so, so there is a hope for compensation for these young victims. And, and we've seen this before in other situations, mm -hmm. whether it's tobacco litigation or yes. we're starting to see it with big pharma in the opioid litigation, Absolutely, we where are. where bankruptcy is actually a solution because they sit mm -hmm. up, they set up these what, what we're calling victims compensation trusts, mm -hmm. and, and that actually allows for a settlement pool, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know we've seen before that. These, these lawyers that are representing these plaintiffs are able to then set them up to actually receive funding back from, from the Boy Scouts of America through the bankruptcy proceeding. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's, again, you know, we talked about this with Weinstein, yeah. you can't, there's nothing you can do to actually fix what happened to these, these children in this situation. But I mean, do you think this is a good situation that it, bank, Boy Scouts of America have been moved into bankruptcy and these trusts have been created? I think at the end of the day, it's the best thing that they can do. It's really the only thing that they can do, which is 
to give some hope of some sort of compensation. And along with that compensation, and I think more importantly than just the money, is by the act of giving this settlement to these young victims, it's them finally admitting. I use that term loosely, right? Because right. legally, they may not be admitting they've done anything wrong, but they're saying, we've heard you. We're so sorry you're in this situation and this is the best we can do, but we're so sorry you feel this way, is how it can be perceived for these young victims. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, and that kind of gets into the next point. A lot of people are asking questions that the assets of the Boy Scouts of America have been valued somewhere between one and $10 billion. Mm -hmm. And their debts or liabilities have been valued at about 500 million to a billion. So obviously assets are projected way above yeah. liabilities. And so it begs the question, well, why are they filing bankruptcy? But it seems to me, and, and you tell me what you think, but they probably see on the horizon that these claims are going to keep coming. And so they'll have to pay these claims out, pay their lawyers, mm -hmm. keep operating it. It sounds to me like part of the reason they're doing this is there's not going to be any money left over for the victims, right? I would think so. I think they're trying to head it off at the pass of, you know, turning off the leaky faucet of draining money so that they do have something to give to the young victims for compensation. So. I mean, it sounds forward thinking on their part. And, and I think the attitude they've taken, it's its terrible, these allegations and what has happened. I think the Boy Scouts of America as a national organization are mm -hmm. trying to take ownership of this. They they published a full page letter explaining all of this mm -hmm. on their website today. They actually, I, I've read that they're they are going to take out an ad in the USA, USA Today tomorrow. Oh, wow. Full page ad with that letter in it explaining this is what we're doing, this mm -hmm. is why we're doing it. And so it's in a very tragic situation, it mm -hmm. seems that this is an organization who's trying to stay true to its character, yeah. trying to stay true to what it was founded for, and is trying to do the right thing by by pushing this into bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's a good silver lining in, in a in a real cloudy, really tough tough situation. Well, that covers a lot of what's going on this week and Absolutely. a lot of how the law applies to all these things. It's mm -hmm. it's extremely interesting. You see the crossover of criminal, civil, bankruptcy, and how this all applies, and then, you know, certain situations like the airline where, hey, let's just have some common sense and be nice to one <laughs> let's another, Let's just right? actually talk to someone yeah. instead of texting. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you for being here with us on Hashtag Lawyered. We're going to continue to cover what's trending in law and business in Dallas and keep you guys up to date on how this affects your daily lives.